button on YouTube and then should be And just give me a thumbs up and we're good to go. Okay. Well, thanks everyone so much for joining us. I'm State Representative Jonathan Brostoff from the 19th District here in Wisconsin. And I really appreciate you being with us. Obviously, uh, this is a completely virtual kind of educational forum on qualified immunity. Um, and if things were normal, we'd be in the state capitol right now. But the nice thing about this is it gives the opportunity for a lot more people to view this session than we'd normally have. So it's a wonderful benefit to this. And uh, I want to just start off by thanking uh, everyone who helped make this happen um, and thanking our partners. Um, you know, first off, uh, all of our legislative partners, some of whom will be speaking today. Uh, I want to thank... Um, well, uh, the campaign to end qualified immunity, um, Ben and Jerry from Ben and Jerry's, uh, the uh, Institute for Justice and the Cato Institute, which <laughs> I never in my life, uh, especially as a big government Democrat, thought I'd, those words would come out of my mouth, but it's, uh, I think, speaks to the importance of this issue and how much it crosses the ideological spectrum that you can have a group like the Cato Institute and a you know, Medicare for all type of big government Democrat like myself, both on board with this issue. And, um, you know, that's that's what we're dealing with right now. This is one that really crosses the crosses the spectrum. And the nature of today's forum is going to be an opportunity to give a lot of uh, uh, education on a wildly important topic. Obviously, with everything going on, there's a lot of people looking for different policy solutions to end some of the grave injustices plaguing our society, especially when it comes to racial inequity and qualified immunity for a lot of those people is at top of the list, um, including myself. And uh, we have a, a master group of experts um, from a bunch of different fields who are going to be um, giving their insights and, and expressing their expertise today. There's also gonna be an opportunity for questions and for um, members of the audience to uh, just ask whatever you know, is, uh, is of interest to you. And um, we also are gonna hear from some folks directly affected, uh, including uh, Sylvia Gonzalez, um, who is with, um, she's a um, client of the Institute for Justice. And um, yeah, we just really appreciate everyone being here today. And I also just wanna give a huge shout out to my staff, uh, Rebecca, and especially Michael, who went above and beyond to help put this together. It's a lot of work, incredibly complicated, and they did a great job of putting it together in a short amount of time. And without them, this would not have been possible. So thank you very much. Um, and with that, uh, I think it's time to get started for our program. Um, in Wisconsin right now, uh, like many states, we're looking at ending qualified immunity. And we've seen in uh, Colorado, we've seen in New Mexico and other states that are not only looking at this, but passing it already. And I think there's a lot of energy in, in the world right now for this in this country. Um, but it's also an issue that's incredibly misunderstood and very complicated. So we're going to be going over that today. And here in Wisconsin, we have AB 186, which is um, the kind of initial Wisconsin version on taking it on and, and tackling it here. And uh, we have uh, about 20 co-sponsors, which is a pretty good amount, but I'm hoping that after today there'll be some more education and we have some of our colleagues who can look into it and again start to address the uh, incredible um, injustices that continue to plague our state and our country. Um, with that, I'm going to um, kick it off to uh, our colleague who is also um, one of the leaders in the assembly on this and uh, we're going to have uh, Representative Myers speak first, and then Representative Moore Makunde, and then Senator uh, Senator Latanya Johnson. We have two Senator Johnsons, but definitely uh, Senator Latanya Johnson will be joining us as well. And then we're going to um, begin uh, the uh, program with um, Professor Bowden, and Michael will take it from there. So, uh, Representative Myers, uh, the floor is yours. If you'd like to speak on your your uh, opinions, and thank you very much for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Representative Brostoff, and thank you for all of you that are joining here today. Um, qualified immunity is something that I'm very passionate about in making sure that we rectify uh, this aspect of law in our state. 
I think, uh, you know, Representative Brasov has been a, a champion and a good leader on this issue. I'm happy that we were able to come to the table together and work on this particular piece of legislation to make sure that we kind of right the wrongs that uh, we see within some of our statutes and our policies. I also want to point out that qualified immunity is something, and ending qualified immunity, is something that is a bipartisan issue. So when you look at a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, the st statistics that have come out, um, you know, in white papers and, and from think tanks across the country, you will see that this is something that is truly a bipartisan effort. It is not just a single party issue. This is something that is good people policy. That's exactly what it is. So making sure that we have responsibility that is taken on both sides. Um, you know, maybe I'm not as fiery as Representative Brostoff sometimes when he talks about, you know, some of the equity issues that we have. But I want to say that this is most definitely something that is an equity issue for me um, and making sure that we have uh, responsibility and accountability on all fronts. I think that's something that we have to have. I'm a champion of accountability for everybody. You know, I get on people in my own party all the time, uh, have no problem with that. We hold everybody accountable. Um, but I want to make sure that we do the right thing by people. I think when you see a lot of the court cases that have come up over the years, and I'm thinking back even to, um, even going back to Trayvon Martin, which was some of the, uh, which is where a lot of the catalysts for the new you know, uh, aspect, this newest iteration of the civil rights movement has happened. Um, there were questions when it came to qualified immunity back then. Um, and when you look at some of the calls that we have, we wanna make sure that there's equity on board for both sides. So I wanna make sure that we look at that. And I'm sure that there will be some resources that will be exchanged here, um, <clears throat> excuse me, from Representative Brostoff's office and um, from the professor that's gonna speak about how we can be a champion for this and kind of bring both sides together to have conversation and also to have bipartisan co-sponsorship for, uh, for this particular bill. So thank you again, Representative Brostoff uh, and the re other representatives that are on. I'm happy to see that we have a cross section of folks here who care about this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, if you, uh... I'm actually not in the state capitol right now, despite my background. I'm at home, so if you see my little guys running across the screen, that's what's going on in the background. Um, and uh, uh, Representative Moore Makunde, I'm going to kick it to you, and thank you very much. Well, thank you so very much, uh, Representative Brostoff. Um, I want to join uh, Representative Myers um, in, in appreciating you, your staff, and all of our guests here today. Uh, I think uh, for myself, qualified immunity, there's a lot of Supreme Court cases, and I'm sure that some of our professors and our professionals will talk about those and what happened in 1981 and 1982, which brings us to this point um, that we're at now. However, I think most importantly for everyday lay folks, um, qualified immunity is important because uh, we have to make sure that we are taking things into, cons into consideration when we do our jobs. Um, and specifically as it relates to law enforcement, when we go into um, certain communities, when we go into certain areas, we have to have on our mind doing our job and doing it in effectively and having the dignity uh, for those that we are serving at that particular time as well. And making sure that we aren't overstepping our bounds, overstepping the lines, and also that we aren't creating a habit of doing so as well. That there is some degree of accountability so that if there is any degree of uh, impropriety that it's nipped in the bud. And so I think that one of the most important things about qualified immunity is making sure that no matter who you are, no matter what you do, uh, you're gonna be held accountable. And, um, and, and, at, and at the very least, it will give you pause to make you think about the, what it is that you're, you're going to be doing. Like I said, I don't wanna steal the thunder from uh, uh, our guests here today. However, uh, they were gonna, they're gonna go into the weeds a little bit more about what we're gonna be talking about because I could just go into the all the cases that we have or however I'll leave that, leave that up to the experts. Thank you so much uh, and I'm glad to be a part of this and I'm glad to be on this bill with you Representative Brostoff and Representative Myers. Thank you um, and uh, yeah, like I said, Representative Myers and uh, Moore McCune have both been huge leaders uh, on, on this as well as a lot of other civil rights issues that are facing Wisconsin today. Um, I got a text from uh, Senator uh, Latanya Johnson, and we're having a couple logistical issues, so we might um, 
just uh, go ahead and move on and we'll see uh, if she's going to be joining us a little bit later. But that being said, uh, I think it's time that we should move to our first presenter. Um, we're going to have uh, Professor William Bow joining us. Um, and I, like I said, there's an opportunity for anyone who has any questions. Uh, this is an educational legislative briefing above all else. So we want to make sure that any questions you have, uh, feel free to um, ask and, uh, you know, he'll, he'll be here. Oh, I'm sorry, we do have uh, Senator Johnson joining us. Sorry, before the professor, uh, Senator will be speaking and then we'll kick it to Professor Bode um, and as well as a question and answer section. So uh, Senator Johnson, welcome and thank you very much. Thank you so much and thank you for doing this. We all know that qualified immunity um, is a very, very um, controversial topic for some, but a very needed topic in our communities. I'll just speak for Milwaukee, for example. Milwaukee has a $1.6 billion budget. 300 million of that is slated just for police. And when we look at the amount of money these lawsuits cost our municipalities and our cities, for example, Milwaukee County has a $5 million reserve that's used in cases of emergency. And in case some of our budgets go over, um, such as overtime for police comes from this reserve budget. Our infrastructure comes from this reserve budget also. But in the event of lawsuits um, for the city of Milwaukee as a result of police departments, that money also comes from that budget if the projections allow. But if there is um, projected overhead that's going to cost more than the $5 million in, in reserve, then those settlements are bonded for. That means we borrow to pay for those lawsuits in the event that we don't have money in our reserve funds, which in many of the cases is exactly that, that's the case. So not only are the taxpayers paying for these settlements, but they're paying for these settlements with interest. And that's a huge concern, especially when we look at how much money is being spent on in our communities. Only about 4% of the budget is dedicated for that because fire and safety is so expensive. So making sure that we can find ways to, um, to um, deal with um, qualified immunity and protect the taxpayers is of extreme concern. So I just want to say thank you to all of our guest speakers and thank you for being here. And I will turn it over to Representative Brostoff. Thank you, Senator Johnson. And uh, yeah, it's, I can, yeah, I think that's a really good way to frame it. And that one of the big issues with qualified immunity is that the municipality gets hit, you know, gets traumatized from the event, from someone suffering at, you know, let's say police brutality, you know, killing or beating or something of that nature. But then there's kind of a further burden they must bear when having to pay out these settlements. And in Milwaukee, it's, a, as Senator Johnson said, a pretty significant uh, portion, but I think that's that's not unique to Milwaukee. I think that's the case in a lot of areas. And that's a, that's a really good point. I just want to reemphasize that. And with that, we're going to go to uh, our uh, distinguished professor, Professor Bode, and uh, also former law clerk uh, recently for uh, Justice Roberts. Um, so very distinguished and you know, a thought leader on qualified immunity across the country. Um, a lot of great articles if you're interested in reading some, some follow up from him, but uh, we'll hand it over to you. And thank you very much, Professor Bode. Uh, thank you very much for, for having me here. And I'm glad to see this is uh, starting to get people's attention. Um, so I think I'm here to just provide a little bit of sort of nationwide perspective and background about how uh, we got into this mess um, and how you all can help get us out of it. Um, but so I'll, I'll cover that pretty quickly, but I'm also happy to talk about anything if people have questions and so on. So the, the doctrine of qualified immunity by that name uh, is a federal sort of, is a federal law doctrine in addition to a doctrine in many states that applies to, to camp cases to claims to enforce constitutional rights, civil rights under the federal civil rights statute. 
And it goes back more than 50 years to a Supreme Court decision from 1967 called Pearson versus Ray by Chief Justice Earl Warren, actually, um, where he first sort of inaugurated the idea that when a police officer does something unconstitutional, when they arrest you and violate your constitutional rights to arrest you, that doesn't mean you should get a remedy. That doesn't mean you can sue them. Uh, You have to also ask whether the police officer uh, acted in bad faith. So you can have something that's like unconstitutional, but good faith, which um, as I'll talk about in a second, might have been seen as an oxymoron to the people who wrote the constitution and thought it was supposed to sort of mark what counted as good faith. But, But he sort of started that conversation. And then over the course of 15 years, the Supreme Court had a series of cases that built up to a the other major qualified immunity precedent people may have heard of uh, called Harlow versus Fitzgerald in 1982, where the Supreme Court took these ideas of, of good faith and, and some kinds of a defense and sort of hardened it into the qualified immunity doctrine that's really created a lot, created the situation we have today, uh, where the Supreme Court said to violate, to, to, to be able to sue somebody who violates your constitutional rights, so to be able to get a remedy when somebody acted unconstitutionally it's not enough to show they acted unconstitutionally. You have to also show they violated clearly established law. And the Supreme Court went on to say that's an objective test. And of course, it doesn't mean just that you violated the Constitution. It means that you violated Supreme Court decisions that made it really, really clear that what you were doing was unconstitutional. Uh, and the Supreme Court's had 30 cases where they've uh, immunized officers from all sorts of uh, horrible constitutional violations, saying that you can only sue somebody under the doctrine of qualified immunity if they are either plainly incompetent or knowingly violate the law. So it's a, it's a very high standard. Um, it's sort of an exception to be able to, to pierce through this qualified immunity. Most of the time, police officers are shielded by it. Uh, and in fact, even recent cases have suggested even if the officers did knowingly violate the law, maybe you can't sue them. So there's a recent case where officers were actually trained that people have a constitutional right to to videotape the police while they're uh, executing their duties because we have a right to you know, be, know what the police are doing. And the police knew that and they still went and arrested him and took the video and tried to delete it. Uh, and the court still said they have qualified immunity because even though they'd been trained in it, you know, maybe, maybe it wasn't completely clear that it was unconstitutional. Uh, so it's just, it's just built up as this huge uh, shield uh, against, against constitutional claims. And now it, it has a lot of problems, um, which I'll just, I'll put quickly into kind of two categories here. One is a kind of general lawfulness separation of powers problem. Um, so one is the problem of where do we even get this idea from? Uh, the Supreme Court has tried in various ways, I won't, I won't dive too deeply into the details, but has tried in various ways to, to say, well, maybe this comes from some sort of common law principle. Maybe this comes from the idea of, of due process due process for the officer, where we have to make sure that we're being totally fair to the officer who's violated your rights and have to make sure that the officer knew that they might have to you know, pay a penalty for the unlawful things they did. Uh, but these doctrines, these justifications really don't uh, hold up upon serious inquiry. Um, in fact, if you look uh, at sort of the founding or at the common law or sort of the long history of the country, the general principle has actually been that when people who enforce the law violate the law, they're supposed to pay the price. So we do have special immunities built into the system for judges, because of course, if you're unsatisfied with the judicial ruling, you're supposed to appeal it. You don't go suing the judge. Same thing for legislators. So if you're unsatisfied with the law, you're supposed to challenge that in the courts in the normal course of events. But for the people who have uh, badges and guns and really the ability to to sort of violate our rights on a daily basis, they're supposed to be held to the the same legal standards that, that you know, me and everybody else is. I mean, if anything, they'd be held to a higher standard because they have special responsibility and special training and, you know, all sorts of horrible things that can go wrong when they abuse their powers. So the kind of fundamental tradition uh, points against any kind of, of immunity, qualified immunity, or any other kind of immunity for constitutional claims. The fundamental tradition suggests that in general, when people, when people violate the law, they ought, to be, they ought to be held to account. And the Supreme Court has kind of had this strange detour for about 50 years in trying to to create an immunity that really didn't have any place in the Constitution, didn't have any place in in federal statutory law. It's kind of a form of of judge-made common law, although the Supreme Court wouldn't admit that that's what it's doing, but that's, that's essentially what they've done. Now, this doctrine, I think, everything I've said would have been uh, heretical for me to say even five years ago. 
Uh, but luckily, in the past few years, uh, a sort of a nationwide conversation has started recognizing this, recognizing that something has gone wrong in the doctrine of qualified immunity, that it's not just some some rule that's been there forever and people learned about in law school 100 years ago. So we just kind of live with it, you know, like weird things about mortgages. But that's that's really something sort of unusual to the law. Um, so some Supreme Court justices have started to criticize it. Uh, members of Congress have started to, to question it and consider repealing it. Um, as the representative mentioned, several states started to take the lead in in questioning it and and looking back at it. And so now it's it's time for the sort of the nationwide conversation about how we want to enforce the Constitution and more fundamentally, really, about whether the rule of law um, applies to applies to police officers. Now, one piece of good news is that in Wisconsin itself, the courts have actually been a little more cognizant of their role than the U.S. Supreme Court. So they have been a little more uh, cognizant about saying the responsibility for these immunity doctrines lies with the legislature. It's not our place to invent immunity doctrines that that weren't there, that, that the legislature didn't want there. That you know, it's not trying to do the same kind of uh, shenanigans, frankly, that the U.S. Supreme Court and the federal courts have done. Um, but of course, that means the responsibility is with the legislature to look at the systems of immunities that have arisen and ask whether that creates a system of law enforcement or rights protection that uh, that makes any sense. And, and I guess I, I, you know, I do want to lend my voice here to say I think something you know does need to be done. Um, that the the basic idea that the people who have the ability to enforce the law and are bound by higher law, by the state constitution, by the federal constitution shouldn't have some kind of remedy when, when they do something wrong is sort of contrary to the first principles of American government, that uh, every right has a remedy, that the people who sort of take a public trust from the state take on some responsibility to ex exercise that uh, exercise that responsibly. Um, and so I think it's you know very important, very good that we're, that we're thinking about these kinds of, of reforms here. Uh, I guess just two other things I want to I want to mention, and then we have a lot of other people who want to have things to say. So again, I'm cognizant of keeping my mouth shut and moving on. Uh, but two other things to mention is you know this doesn't mean I, I guess you know a, a question I often hear and that often comes up is sort of you know why do you hate police officers or why don't you understand that that it's a really hard job that police officers have. And so I want to be very clear. I don't think this is in any way about hostility to uh, the police or frankly about abolishing the police or other things people sometimes talk about. Um, I think it's just, you know, part and parcel of thinking about, you know, what kind of rules and how, what kind of supervision are we going to have for the police? Should there be rules? Should there be supervision? And I guess I think it's not too much to say the answers to those questions are, are yes. I think it's true that uh, police have a very hard job, sometimes getting harder every year. Um, and I just think we don't do them any favors by creating a bunch of rules and then telling them we don't actually care whether they follow them. I think we ought to think carefully about what rules we want police to follow, and then we ought to make them follow them in a sort of straightforward way. And that's sort of showing a lot more respect to, to everybody involved in the process. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is, and this is also uh, related to the points about um, the taxpayers ultimately fitting the bill and how this you know affects the budgets of cities and so on. So I do think this also has to be part of a larger conversation. Um, so it's inevitable that, that when there are judgments, some of the... Um, one way or another, uh, the officers aren't always the ones who end up paying them. Uh, sometimes they're indemnified by law, even when indemnification is not available by law, sometimes it happens in practice. Even when it can't happen in practice, it ends up happening in terms of the higher wages, you have to pay people to become police officers. So it's true that when there are big verdicts uh, for big abuses against government officials, uh, often the taxpayers end up do end up paying directly or indirectly. But what that means is that we have a responsibility to think about supervising the police more broadly. So, you know, my city, the city of Chicago, has a similar has a similar issue. And one thing people are starting to recognize is, uh, you know, people in the city need to need to push for legislation and, frankly, work for ways to enforce it to actually start curbing the abuses. That is, it's not enough to just let police violate people's rights and then say, oh well, we'll let them sue and and you know, that's a happy ending. It's not a happy ending. Uh, the happy ending is when we set up a system where there are incentives and institutions to help make sure the police uh, obey the constitution and obey the highest law of the land. Uh, and then, you know, they do. Thank you. 
All right, thank you so much, Professor Bode. And we are happy if anyone has any direct questions for Professor Bode, if you wouldn't mind just shooting me a direct message in the uh, in the chat, those should only come to me. Um, and then, you know, you don't have to ask the question in the chat, just uh, let me know you have a question and, and we'll be happy to call on you. Otherwise, we will plan on having a more open question and answer session at the end of all of this as well, if uh, if we're still waiting to, to hear and kind of process everything. Um, so, so don't hesitate to reach out. I'll give a couple seconds here if anyone has a question to shoot it to me. Otherwise, we will, uh, after Professor Bode, um, we will get ready to move on to um, Ben Cohen and Jerry Greenfield, who are here with the campaign to end qualified immunity. Um, and so I'm going to give one more call for any questions. I'm not seeing any directly. So if we want to kick it over to Ben and Jerry, uh, we are uh, so happy to have you here. Thanks so much and take it away. Thanks a lot. You know, we have a problem in the United States and Wisconsin is no exception. Derek Chauvin's act was especially egregious and it was caught on video, so he was convicted. But brutalizing and abusing black people is something that happens more frequently than we white people can imagine. And nine times out of 10, the abusive police officer gets away with it because of this legal doctrine known as qualified immunity. In practice, qualified immunity is unqualified impunity. The theory behind qualified immunity is that law enforcement officers are not expected to know the law unless another cop has previously been convicted of violating it. For you and me, Ignorance of the law is no excuse, not so for cops. If I haul off and punch you in the face, you can sue me. But if a cop did it, here's what'll happen. You'll say, I didn't do anything wrong. This cop abused me. The cop's lawyer will say, there's no prior case in this jurisdiction where a cop was convicted for doing exactly the same thing. And the judge will say, that's right. My hands are tied due to qualified immunity and the case gets thrown out of court. Can you imagine how that would make you feel? Jerry and I are here in our role as co-chairs of the national campaign to end qualified immunity. We are a broad coalition of over 16 national organizations from Americans for Prosperity and Cato to the ACLU and the NAACP. We include thousands of former police officers and commanders, business people, actors, musicians, professional athletes, and members of Congress. This campaign is not anti-cop. We understand that the majority of police officers do a good job in difficult circumstances, and many go above and beyond the call of duty. This campaign is about accountability. As employers, Jerry and I know that if you ain't got accountability, you ain't got nothing. If you don't hold your employees accountable, you don't get the results you're looking for. It is accountability on the back end that drives behavior on the front end. You can do all the training and pass all the rules and regulations you want, but if you don't hold cops accountable, you're not going to change behaviors. Let me give you a few examples that didn't make it to TV. A young black man, David Colley, was walking to a friend's house after work. Two F-duty cops heard a radio report about two men who had stolen a pair of sneakers. David didn't fit the, the description, but the officer saw him, yelled out, hey, where are you going? David pointed to his friend's apartment and the cops shot him in the back five seconds after they first saw him. Then the cops falsified their report and said David assaulted them. Eventually, police were forced to release dash cam footage that exposed what the cops had done. 
David is paralyzed for life from the chest down. The cops got off on qualified immunity. Carrie Illich, another young black man, was in a mental health crisis. He was unarmed, wandering the streets, visibly unstable, naked, and covered in scratches. Police arrived and asked him to stop walking. Carrie did not comply, so the officers tased him until he collapsed on the ground. He was face down, convulsing on the concrete, and one of the officers tased him 13 more times. A 300 pound officer knelt on Carrie's upper back, crushing his lungs until blood and froth came from his mouth. He was pronounced DOA at the hospital. They treated him like an animal, said his mother. The judge let the cops off on qualified immunity. Malika Brooks. A 33-year-old black woman was driving her young son to school when a cop pulled her over for allegedly going 12 miles over the limit and wrote out a speeding ticket. Malika took the ticket but refused to sign it because she thought it was an admission of guilt. The officer yelled for her to get out of the car and showed her his taser. Do you know what this is? Malika told the officer that she was pregnant and due in 60 days. The cops tased her three times, 50,000 volts in the neck, thigh, and arm as her 11-year-old son watched. She slumped over. The cops dragged her out of the car and handcuffed her face down on the street. She was rushed to the hospital with a rapid heartbeat. Luckily, her baby was born healthy. The cops got off on qualified immunity. This is not a black problem. This is a white problem. White people hold the power in this country. And the people that we arm and hire to protect and serve are killing unarmed black people before our very eyes and we're letting them get away with it. You have the power to change it. Thank you, Ben. Uh, <clears throat> let me pick up where Ben left off. Uh, as Ben described, there's an urgent need for police reform. Every day we read about police violence and police brutality in the newspaper. We see it on television. We see it online. Trust has eroded, if not fully disappeared, between law enforcement and the communities they serve. The status quo does not work. Ending qualified immunity is not anti-police. And you'll hear everybody here today say that over and over. It is pro-good policing. It's about accountability for police and justice for the victims whose constitutional rights have been violated. The only people that qualified immunity helps are bad cops. There's a movement in states and cities across the country to end qualified immunity because it is such a critical issue. In the last year, qualified immunity has been ended or limited in Colorado, New Mexico, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and New York City. There are bills and discussions in about a dozen more states. Why? because the status quo does not work. For states and legislatures to do nothing does not work. So who's against qualified immunity? As you might imagine, it's the police and some municipalities. The reason is that both groups don't wanna be held accountable legally and financially when law enforcement doesn't follow the law. And let's be clear, we're talking about egregious acts of violence and brutality, the ones we're all reading about. What are the objections from police? Well, first we're told that the immunity is already weak, that it's qualified. But in practice, qualified immunity protections are almost absolute. And not only that, there should be no form of immunity when an officer commits an egregious act of excessive force, not even an immunity that's qualified. 
Then we're told that split second decisions need to be made without hesitation on the job. Well, we agree that officers should not have to think about lawsuits in their day-to-day -day work. But police already have strong constitutional protections without qualified immunity. They don't need to worry about it. Well, how about the idea that qualified immunity will drive people away from policing and cause massive retirements? Well, recent studies show that police have been driven away more by the community turning on them than by the possibility they might lose an obscure legal protection. Without rebuilding trust and respect in communities, recruitment will remain extremely difficult. And the best way to rebuild trust is to put real accountability measures in place, including ending qualified immunity. There is no doubt that law enforcement will be very vocal about their objections. They like not having accountability. And I understand that, but qualified immunity is a fundamentally unfair and unjust policy. After New York City ended qualified immunity, the Police Benevolent Association sent a letter to its members advising them, quote, you are strongly cautioned against engaging in any stop and frisk unless doing so for your own or other's safety, search of a car, residence, or person, unless you are certain that you are clearly and unequivocally within the bounds of law, unquote. I mean, they're essentially telling the police they have to stay within the bounds of the law. Well, I thought it was nice for them to make that clear. I'll end with a quote from senior policy analyst Jordan Richardson of Americans for Prosperity, a conservative advocacy group. Quote, qualified immunity may have originated as a doctrine to protect good police officers working in difficult situations. But now, four decades later, it has morphed into a doctrine that regularly protects egregious violations of constitutional rights by damaging the trust and confidence that communities have in law enforcement. Qualified immunity is harming the very police officers it was designed to protect." Unquote. Uh, if you guys would like more information about the campaign to end qualified immunity, you can visit the website, holdcopsaccountable.org. In addition, uh, a resource Ben has recently authored a book, Above the Law, How Qualified Immunity Protects Violent Police. Uh, thank you so much for having us. Thank you so much, Ben and Jerry. Um, if anyone has any questions, please, again, don't hesitate to direct them to me in the chat. I believe Senator Taylor had one comment that she was hoping to share if she is on and would like to, to toss that out. Otherwise, let's see. I was just asking for him to re thank you so much. I'm sorry. I was just asking him to repeat. Um, he said a catchy phrase that I wanted to uh, remember and I can't remember it. Um, it made me think of something my father always says, which is you cannot expect what you don't inspect. He said something about qualified immunity and I wanted to write it down so I could take it back and use it was one of my questions. And so I apologize. I was trying to remember even a part of it to make it easier to help me know what that catchy phrase was that you said. Yeah, and, and, my and uh, th thank you very much, Senator Taylor. I think it was qualified immunity is just legal impunity, and uh, it stuck with me as well. And also just wanted to recognize Senator Taylor as one of the leaders in Wisconsin on this issue. And uh, thank you for, for joining us as well. And just wanted to make sure you got recognized for that too. Thank you, Representative. Uh, appreciate those kind words. Um, you know, I want to um, also ask a second question, which kind of revolved around in our state moving the elimination of qualified immunity is like not happening. But what I was hoping is that we might be able to do something similar to what 
Colorado did, which is to put some liability on the officer. And because our particular municipality is self-insured, it basically is leading us to bankruptcy. So um, these lawsuits that are more than 35, 40 billion, 4 billion, well, a lot of money. I remember it was million or billions. I think about what they did in Colorado. It was a concept of like up to, I think 25,000 or something. Yeah, and um, the part of that question cut out a little bit, Senator Taylor, because of some logistical issues. Uh, but um, yeah, I think I think Do it's you need me to repeat it. So I say, say it one more time. Do you need me to repeat it? Uh, sure. Short answer is the question about qualified immunity that was done differently in, I believe, Colorado that allowed for a portion of liability to fall on the officer, I wanna say up to 25,000, because I don't believe, I know we won't, I've been asking since I've done the police reform bills that I was able to get for something different with qualified immunity and haven't been able to get agreement on that. So I'm wondering if you could tell us about what they did in Colorado and whether or not you're finding that that is a better first step for places that are really against movement. Sure, and that's actually probably a question that's best suited for not our next speaker, but the second to next one, Jay, who uh, worked on that specifically. And we've actually had a lot of discussions uh, as well as if this bill moves forward and we get to committee, if there's kind of a hybrid model, if we wanna want do one that completely you know, if, if there's some amount of liability for a personal one, that's 25,000, 50,000, et cetera, or if it's uh, completely covered elsewhere, if there's going to be insurance. And uh, again, Jay has done a lot of dig deep, deep digging onto that issue. So I think it's probably most appropriate to um, have that be queued up as his first response after he's done giving his presentation. Uh, Jay, if that's all right with you. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so very good questions, uh, Senator uh, Taylor. And yes, that's something we've, we've, definitely need to explore and we've been around the block on and uh, um, you know and, and also I just wanted to mention that I've gotten a couple messages that there's some people having issues with their questions so if you have any questions or comments you can also just shoot us an email and we'll make sure it goes through that way if, if it's not going through elsewhere so apologize for that and uh, um, yeah next up we're going to be joined by um, Officer Terry Blevins, uh, who was able to join us. I know he had a couple of just issues, but very much appreciate uh, his, his work on this and him being here with us. And uh, um, we'll go right from there and we'll keep moving. And thank you very much, Officer Blevins. Thank you, Representative Rostov uh, and, uh, you know, other esteemed folks that are on this call. I, we appreciate you allowing uh, LEAP, Law Enforcement Action Partnership, and me to you know, to add our voices to this discussion, you know, we feel that it's really important for law enforcement to have a voice, uh, you know, to, to contribute to this conversation. And, and um, you know, we feel like that there, there are those of us in law enforcement that, that really uh, have an understanding of this issue and of the, the importance of, you know, discussing this and, and bringing some sanity to this. Um, you know, when I was a police officer, I thought that qualified, I didn't really truly understand what qualified immunity was, uh, but I felt that it, you know, protected us and I felt that it was the right thing. And, but once I learned more about it, I really realized that it, that it, it isn't really in the best interest of law enforcement, especially the, the community, but even in, uh, you know, in, in law enforcement's, uh, uh, you know, favor. And, you know, we have to understand, you know, government and in particular law enforcement's number one responsibility is to protect the rights of its citizens and uh, today it's clear that police departments are only as strong and effective as its personnel we see that with some of the cases that have been mentioned already you know misconduct abuses of power and egregious uses of forces of force are time consuming expensive and uh, really chaotic for 
uh, law enforcement to deal with. I mean, what the, all of these agencies uh, are going through right now is 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 uh, extremely uh, uh, distracting to our original original mission, and we should do anything that we can to try to you know to try to refocus on what our original mission was intended to be. Um, a recent poll found that 63% of Americans support the elimination of qualified immunity. And, um, you know, I know it's been said before in this call, but qualified immunity protects problematic police officers who cause harm to our communities by undermining our relationships and um, our legitimacy as the police in our society, all while squandering limited public safety resources. And those resources are becoming even more limited now. Uh, based on on you know movements that we see all across the country, uh, police legitimacy demands that law enforcement comply with the constitutional, statutory, and professional norms that the public expects of all officers. Uh, the loss of police legitimacy damages the trust needed to solve crime and to keep our community safe. Uh, in a free society, law enforcement requires integrity, accountability, and transparency. Qualified immunity, as we know it, instead promotes fear, distrust, and anger when victims of misconduct are unable to hold bad actors accountable for violations of the law and their constitutional rights. Qualified immunity perpetuates and magnifies this issue. As a career police officer myself, and uh, I was a, a union member uh, as well, uh, my job was more difficult because of qualified immunity. When courts don't hold bad police officers accountable, uh, whether it's through a discipline process, prosecutions, or the ability to, to be held responsible in a civil court case, it impacts the good officers, those of us who held ourselves to a higher professional standard um, uh, commensurate, that was commensurate with the responsibilities of our job. Uh, police officers who are acting lawfully and within the scope of authority do not need to fear the end of qualified immunity. In fact, good officers should, and many do welcome this proposal because it will help victims and strengthen the legitimacy, legitimacy of the police profession. And I'll just, I'll just finish with this. And I know I, 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 I'll take the liberty, I'm sorry, Jerry, of disagreeing with you slightly on one point. You know, you said that police officers shouldn't have to worry about, uh, about being sued. And, and, and I actually disagree with that. I, I, I own a business now and I train all of my employees to worry about lawsuits every single day. The rest of us have to do that in business, in government. We all, you know, have to worry about lawsuits because it's one of the mechanisms in our society that keeps us honest. And so police officers, although it shouldn't be something that consumes them or that, that stresses them out unduly, but they should constantly be aware of the fact that there is a potential for being sued for certain actions that don't fall within the law. And that's something that, that police officers need to have in mind. And that's one of the things that we, Law Enforcement Action Partnership, we're working actively to try to train police officers and to help them understand how uh, qualified immunity uh, does not help their them in their profession or in their job. So thank you again for allowing us to add our voice to this discussion and thank you for doing the work that you're doing on this particular issue. Thank you so much, Sergeant Blevins. Does anyone have any questions for the Sergeant directly? Otherwise, we will go ahead and queue up uh, Jay Senator Schweiger. Taylor, oh, I have one. Yep, go for it, Senator Taylor. Are you doing any work going out informing individuals who are law enforcement, especially those that are law enforcement who also happen to be legislators asking for a friend because <laughs> Because all of our chairs of committee are law enforcement, former law enforcement that would be dealing with these issues on their committee and are pretty much um, not saying what you're saying. So I'm wondering, can you go and talk to your brotherhood? <laughs> well, uh, thank you for the question. <laughs> and, you know, you're absolutely right. And, and, you know, Law Enforcement Action Partnership is really the only organization of its kind in the United States, unfortunately, that is made up of law enforcement officers, prosecutors, and judges, people who former, uh, uh, were formerly serving and currently serving. And since the death of George Floyd, we've had an explosion in membership 
Uh, we've been very, very fortunate about that. But there are more and more police officers who, who are getting involved in this discussion and actually coming out and, and making sense about these issues. Um, and so we do everything we can to try to recruit these officers and to try to, to train them to also go out and speak about these things. And, and we do everything that we can to try to, to make ourselves available to these discussions. So, um, yeah, we're actively doing everything we can, but we're not a big organization, you know, and there are some people that don't want to support a, an organization of law enforcement officers. I get it because of everything that's going on right now. But the reality is that, you know, it just if you get a chance, go to our lips, uh, our website, it's uh, leap.cc, Law Enforcement Action Partnership, and you'll see that we're really, really taking a logical uh, and, and common sense, but yet, uh, you know, very open minded uh, sort of a view of these things and and really trying to just reform law enforcement uh, uh, on on every level. So, um, yes, thank you for I hope I answered your question. You definitely did. And what I would hope is Representative um, Brostoff and others, if, um, you know, maybe what they might be willing to do is consider trying to do a special um, Zoom conversation with you and those that make the difference in our legislature um, who, uh, to have the real conversations that you can have because I appreciate these briefings and it's a lot of good information, but I want to get to the place that we can actually do something and we can't if we don't move those people who basically are the gatekeepers of what happens in our committees because we're not a state that if you put forth the bill that you're going to be heard you know you <laughs> you may never see the light of day and nobody will know that you did it uh, unless you told them so I would love um, you, you're one of the few that I've met um, who has an organization who's doing this kind of work and so I just think it's valuable thank you so much All right, do we have any other questions for Sergeant Blevins? All right, otherwise we're gonna kick it over to Jay Schweikert from the Cato Institute. Take it away, Jay, thanks so much for joining us. Great, thank you. Um, it, it's, it's really a, a joy to be able to, to speak to all of you about this because Cato launched a campaign to eliminate the doctrine of qualified immunity uh, over three years ago. Uh, and at that point in time, qualified immunity was a relatively obscure legal doctrine that most people who weren't either civil rights litigators or academics, you know, even knew of, much less had strong thoughts on. And I think that uh, it's it's a sign of how far things have come and how how um, you know how much progress really we've made that this is now the centerpiece really of policing reform conversations. Um, I do want to you know just offer one clarification, which is that we're obviously focused on qualified immunity here as it pertains to law enforcement, but the doctrine does apply more broadly than that. Uh, and in fact, it applies to all public officials uh, that can be sued for civil rights violations. And there are lots of you know, government agents that commit really egregious violations aside from just police officers. Um, that most obviously to me includes corrections officers, prosecutors, uh, and you know, even certain uh, public educational officials. Um, so I think, it's, you know, I think it is appropriate that we are, that I think this doctrine really does have special urgency with respect to law enforcement but it is something that concerns official accountability across the board, not just the police. Um, so I want to, I mean, I think that, you know, all of, all of the other panelists have done an excellent job of laying out basically the nuts and bolts of what QI is and how it applies. I think what I would like to do is address and respond to what I see as the two most common arguments made in favor of qualified immunity, uh, and then turn a bit to um, Senator Taylor's question from earlier about what options states have to address the doctrine. Um, so the first and probably most prevalent argument that I hear in support of qualified immunity is this idea that, well, you know, police have to make difficult split second decisions under conditions of danger and uncertainty. And, you know, it, it's how is it possibly fair to judge them with the benefit of hindsight, hindsight and let them be sued, you know, anytime they make a mistake. Um, and I think that that's a very reasonable concern. It's just not one that actually has anything to do with qualified immunity. Because what's important to keep in mind is that qualified immunity only matters. It's only doing work in that space between, yes, your rights were violated, but a court says those rights were not clearly established. 
which again usually means that there was a prior judicial decision with functionally identical facts. So if police officers aren't violating anyone's Fourth Amendment rights in the first place, then by definition, they do not need qualified immunity to protect them. And in that regard, it's really important that everyone understand that the Supreme Court uh, in explaining our substantive Fourth Amendment standards, in other words, determining just the basic constitutional law of when someone's rights have been violated in the first place, is already enormously deferential to reasonable on-the-spot police decision-making. In other words, the mere fact that an officer makes the wrong call in the sense of arresting someone who turns out to be innocent uh, or using force that turns out to have been unnecessary, that doesn't amount to a constitutional violation in the first place. Um, because of course, officers have to make those difficult calls and they're not always going to make the call that is you know, the right one with the benefit of hindsight. It's only when an officer acts objectively unreasonably that they have even committed a Fourth Amendment violation in the first place. So I think that that, that level of that respect for deference toward you know, reasonable on the spot decision making and genuine good faith mistakes of judgment is very important, but that's already built into our constitutional law and we don't need qualified immunity to protect it. And then the second most common argument is the idea that qualified immunity will somehow deter or screen out frivolous lawsuits. Uh, and that you know, even if these suits were ultimately unsuccessful, simply having to you know, sit for depositions and et cetera is an enormous burden in terms of time and cost and you know, qualified immunity therefore is important just to spare public officials uh, from, that, from that cost. And again, I think that this is reasonable in the abstract, but it's just not something that qualified immunity is actually protecting against. Because again, the doctrine only kicks in if someone's rights have been violated. So by definition, that means that is a meritorious lawsuit, not a frivolous one. Um, and if you look at the scholarship of Joanna Schwartz, a UCLA law professor and really the leading empirical scholar of qualified immunity, um, she has a very in-depth study from 2017 called How Qualified Immunity Fails, where she goes through every single, she has, like, surveys every single Section 1983 case against police officers uh, brought over a two-year period in, in certain districts and shows that only 0.6% of all of those lawsuits were actually dismissed at the pleading stage on the basis of qualified immunity. In other words, before discovery occurs. Um, so what that, what that indicates is that when cases are genuinely non-meritorious, there are other tools of civil procedure that are perfectly capable of dismissing them. The cases that qualified immunity is blocking from going forward are exactly those that raise meritorious claims. Um, so now turning to the sort of practical question of like what states can do about it, and, and specifically um, you know, the, the Colorado approach that Senator Taylor mentioned. Um, you know, of course, qualified immunity generally what we mean by that is, the, is a federal judicial doctrine. It is, in theory, a gloss on a particular federal statute, Section 1983. And states, of course, don't have the authority to change federal law. States can't say that in, in Section 1983 suits in their state, qualified immunity won't apply. But what states can do and what states have been doing and what we mean really by qualified immunity reform in, at the state level is states can create a state level civil rights law that essentially is a kind of analog to our federal civil rights law, section 1983. And then states can clarify that as a matter of state law, qualified immunity will not be available as a defense. And that's exactly what Colorado did. Uh, they created a cause of action against police officers who violate people's constitutional rights. And then they said, you know, qualified immunity will not apply. So from the victim's perspective, if their rights were violated, they get a remedy, period. And I think that is exactly, that is the judgment that section 1983 was written to provide, but which qualified immunity has undermined. Now, I think the other important question here that is a bit more complicated goes to this issue of indemnification. Um, as many of you are probably aware, even today, police officers are nearly always indemnified in any civil rights suit against them, whether or not they receive qualified immunity. And the, and the practical reality, because most officers you know, are going to lack the resources to cover full judgments, is that indemnification is going to continue probably in one way or another. But what I think Colorado did that was very um, creative and uh, you know, thoughtful was it ensured that officers have skin in the game. 
Because what it basically said is that presumptively, defendants sued under that statute would be fully indemnified. But if the police department determines the officer did not have an objective good faith belief in the legality of their conduct, then the officer would be responsible for a small portion of the judgment, either 25,000 or 5% of the judgment, whichever was less. And that may sound small, but I think it's, 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 this, it's, it's important precisely because it gives officers skin in the game. And I think this goes to what Sergeant Blevins was talking about. Um, I think there should, you know, police off, we do want police officers to you know, have somewhere in their minds the risk that if they actually, you know, violate people's rights, they can be held accountable. Um, and in that respect, I think that is an important difference between the Colorado law and the more recent New Mexico law, which simply made public employers fully liable. And, and I think that approach, again, it covers, it covers the judgment for the victim, but it, in my view, sidesteps the individual accountability for individual officers, which I think is a huge part of what we want out of civil rights laws. Um, so there, there, you know, there are a number of different ways you know, states can do that. I don't mean to suggest that Colorado's is the one and only approach. Um, and certainly, you know, we, I, you know, I think as this moves forward, we'd be happy to have those conversations with any members in more detail. But what I do think is a, an important piece of the discussion is ensuring that individual officers have skin in the game. I think without that component, um, you're not going to get the right individual incentives to make sure that officers respect people's constitutional rights. Excellent, thanks so much, Jay. Um, does anyone have any questions specifically for Jay? Um, okay, it looks like we have one from Representative Moore Omokunde who might want to, if you want to uh, chime in here, Representative. Sure. Uh, there has been a lot of conversation um, about absolute versus qualified immunity, and I'm wondering if you could uh, make a distinction between the two and how that relates to our everyday interactions with law enforcement. Sure. Sure. So, you know, it, qualified immunity is a is a general defense that's available to any public official sued under Section 1983, our federal civil rights statute. So any any public official, you know, prison corrections officers, police officers, uh, public you know educational officials, city council members, etc., can invoke qualified immunity. Um, the Supreme Court has also, in my view, invented erroneously a doctrine of absolute immunity for prosecutors. Uh, and held that prosecutors, when they are acting in their prosecutorial capacity, are absolutely immune for any civil rights suit against them, even if they committed a willful constitutional violation. You know, I mean, willfully withholding evidence for the purposes of, you know, railroading an innocent defendant, even that would not be actionable against a prosecutor. Um, so I think that's, that's an enormously serious problem in its own right. Um, I mean, we have been more focused on qualified immunity in our advocacy just because we think it's, it's a larger problem that applies to more public officials. Uh, but I think the absolute immunity that prosecutors enjoy is just as lawless in terms of an invented judicial doctrine that has no basis in the text or history uh, of our civil rights law. Uh, and that I think it, you know, it would be you know, valuable and important for states to take up in their own right to ensure that we have accountability uh, for the criminal adjudication phase of the criminal justice system, as well as the policing stage. So it's kind of like when we had the, the Central Park Five and when they went to uh, seek justice from the prosecutor who actually uh, blocked newer evidence or, or didn't show that these five young men were not even in the area. Uh, during that time, uh, they were not able to get any recourse because of this doctrine. That's right. Yeah, no matter how egregious or willful or obvious a constitutional violation by a prosecutor, they can never be held civilly liable to their victims. And I just think, I mean, I don't, I don't think anyone even purports to try to defend that. I can't imagine what a defense of that would be. But uh, it's, it's, it flies under the radar just because it doesn't come up as often as qualified immunity. But yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a significant issue in its own right. Thank you. Did we have any other questions for Jay? May I build on um, a question that came from Representative uh, Maura Mukunde's um, 
questioning? Wonderful, thank you. Um, so in thinking about that, it made, in hearing that, it made me realize that we did do something in Wisconsin that did deal with qualified immunity. I wanna say that Senator Teston, I don't remember who was on it. Uh, I can't remember it. And it's funny because Senator Teston couldn't even remember it. I've got, <laughs> shows you how much we remember all of the stuff we do. I'm gonna go back and look at that because it did not, address law enforcement because I remember, you know, like trying to see if there was a connection in that regard. Um, but I want to go back and look at that in the lens of what you are saying and talking about. So representative Rostov, you, that means that once I go back and look at it, somebody's going to have to help us to connect so I can even remember what kind of what he just said. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that sounds great. And I'll, you know, we've, we've talked about this, um, you know, one on one, but I'm happy to continue the conversation and always looking for more opportunities, especially, like I said, I mean, this is certainly, uh, as Representative Myers pointed out, not a uh, strictly partisan issue. Obviously, we've seen the states where this is passing and the zeitgeist around the country. Um, there's and actually, and as represented by even the presenters on this call, uh, or on this, this, this educational opportunity that you know, this really crosses the ideological spectrum. And there's people who uh, recognize on the far left, you know, middle left, middle right, far right, how wildly important, um, you know, th this, uh, you know, moving forward with this policy is. And, and there might be some different ideas around, you know, absolute indemnity, partial indemnity, not, you know, not, you know, there's different ways to cut it. But I think that I, uh, yeah, you're, you know, you're right. There's a lot in the details and I would hope that Senator Teston, if you're watching, you know, I have to continue the conversation with you as well, but any of our Republican colleagues who are on right now or staff, uh, we're happy to keep it moving. So yes, absolutely. And thank you for bringing that up, Senator Taylor. Wonderful, wonderful. I, I look forward to that because you're, um, you know, right, Representative Myers and I have approached it from a slightly, you know, different approach, trying to find, right, that that synergy around a way that it may uh, move people because when it was done before, it wasn't something that was being thought about. It was strictly being thought about, presented, probably not even crossing their mind that it connected to law enforcement because they were thinking about it only in the way of, I want to say state employees or something like that. So um, I look gotcha. forward to circling back and helping them to see the intersection and then seeing where we can, you know, where we can all meet, meet in the middle where the work is done. Great, and um, I know, uh, you know, we've got quite a few questions queued up for the general uh, segment of Q&A. Um, so with that, uh, I want to say thank you very much, Jay. And uh, we know that you'll probably, some of those questions are gonna go to you directly as well, it looks like, but appreciate your insight. And I think we need to move to our last two speakers speakers before the general Q&A, uh, which is attorney Anya Bidwell and her client Sylvia Gonzalez uh, with the Institute for Justice. Um, and, you know, it's funny, I have a long history with the organization and normally, especially in committee, we're kind of on the opposite side of the spectrum, but today we're coming together on this important subject and, uh, you know, making sure that we can get the information out there, but with some firsthand account of someone who's directly involved. And so we really appreciate um, Anya and her organization for bringing that to the forefront and, and as well as important work on this issue. Thank you for having us. Very happy to be on the same side of issue with you today. Um, so uh, I'm an attorney with IJ and Sylvia Gonzalez. Uh, Sylvia, wave your hand. Uh, Sylvia my, Gonzalez. I hear. <laughs> <laughs> She's my client. Um, so uh, she's the one who's been affected directly by uh, the types of things that qualified immunity does to uh, lawsuits, right? So I'll talk for about, uh, you know, a couple of minutes and then pass it on to Sylvia, who will tell you her story. Um, and as you listen to us, consider this um, one question. Um, who should carry the burden of the constitutional violation? Uh, should it be the perpetrator and those folks who hired and trained that person? Or should it be the victim of the violation, like Sylvia? 
uh, throughout our history, um, uh, there was this one through line, right? Justice Marshall put it best, right? Where there is a right, there must be a remedy. Um, this could be done through suing the officer directly. Uh, this historically could have also been done uh, through holding municipalities to a higher standard through the doctrine of respondeat superior liability. But one thing remained clear. The courts were concerned with making sure that where there is a right, there must be a remedy, right? But during this 50 year detour, as Professor Bode calls it, <laughs> the focus uh, has been on making it actually more convenient and less expensive for government workers, police officers and other government workers, right? As Jay said, it protects all folks working for the government. It's, the focus has been on making it more convenient and less expensive for them, leaving the victim like Sylvia to carry the cost of the constitutional violation. Not only were her rights violated, she's also the one out in the cold. So government workers can be protected. Um, Sylvia and I, we thought that our best value added here would be to actually tell you about qualified immunity litigation as we face it on a daily basis and our experience with it. Um, this might give you a good idea about the types of challenges we're facing and, and also kind of the, the whole thing about closing the courthouse door, right? So qualified immunity closes the courthouse door when it comes to federal questions essentially. Qualified immunity applies there. But you guys can open an alternative state courthouse door, right? And the good thing is that often constitutional violations can be brought through state courthouse doors, right? Through uh, state claims. And this is where you come in. Um, uh, so um, uh, let me, uh, I guess the best way for me to kind of go about it is to tell you a story of one of our clients, Shanice West, and then I'll transition to Sylvia. So Shanice, uh, one afternoon in 2014, um, Shanice West and her young children um, stopped by their house on the way to school. And um, they uh, found uh, five local police officers surrounding the house. Uh, Shanice said, what's going on? And police told her that they were looking for her former boyfriend um, and um, there was a warrant for his arrest uh, on some weapon charges completely unrelated to what Shanice was doing. It was her former boyfriend, right? Um, and Shanice basically said that the guy certainly is not in her house, but she said, here's the key, right? If you wanna come into my house and look for him, you're more than welcome to. She didn't have time for anything more, right? She just gave the key and she went with her kids to school because she needed to register them for classes. So uh, police officers, instead of using this key she gave them, right? To open the door and look for the guy called a SWAT unit. Uh, and this SWAT unit proceeded to lay siege to the house, bombarding it from the outside with tear gas grenades. Uh, when it was all over, Shanice's home and all of her possessions inside the house were destroyed. Um, and uh, just as Shanice had said, the ex-boyfriend was nowhere to be found, right? Instead, uh, police spent half a day bombarding and besieging a house that was empty um, except for Shanice's dog. Um, and as a result of this siege, Shanice, she was left homeless for months, right? You can look at the photographs and it's just everything is covered with this weird green muck from the tear grass grenades and a lot of stuff was destroyed. Uh, so Shanice filed a lawsuit uh, and alleging that the officers who bombarded her house violated her constitutional rights, Fourth Amendment rights, right? Uh, because they uh, did that without a warrant to enter the home. Um, and they also exceeded the scope of her consent, right? She said, you can come into the house, here's the key. Instead, they bombarded it. Um, so the officers predictably, as it happens, and as it happened in Sylvia's case, uh, they invoked qualified immunity. Um, and the Ninth Circuit uh, agreed that qualified immunity protects the officers. And here's the, you know, shocking part, right? There is a case from the United States Supreme Court that specifically says you're not supposed to exceed the scope of content, consent to enter the house, right? 
bombarding someone's house is obviously exceeding that consent, right? But the Ninth Circuit was not concerned with that Supreme Court precedent that supposedly puts officers, especially reasonable officers, on notice that they can't exceed the scope of consent. Instead, they were looking specifically for a case that would say violating consent by bombarding a house with tear gates, grenades is unconstitutional. And because such an outrage thankfully doesn't happen that often, or at least doesn't go through courts that often, you couldn't even find a case on point, right? Therefore, her case was thrown out. She wasn't even able to proceed to discovery and to evidence gathering, which is like a traditional thing to do when you sue uh, non-government entities or non-government people. Um, and again, notice how the officers here, and many speakers already mentioned that, right? The officers here were not acting under time pressure. Uh, there wasn't a time, a split second type of a situation. Um, and again, even if they were, the Fourth Amendment would have protected them anyway, right? Because there is Supreme Court case law that does it, that specifically says, we're not going to look at this with hindsight, with 2020. We're going to give deference to an officer who is acting under time pressure. So uh, they basically... Um, uh, if, if Chinese were allowed to proceed with her litigation under the Fourth Amendment, then this reasonableness standard would have kicked in and the officers would have been giving their due deference, right? But instead, they just invoked qualified immunity and it froze all the litigation uh, in place before she could even open the courthouse door. Um, so, and that's how I come to Sylvia Gonzalez, right? Uh, she's got a lawsuit. Uh, she and I have a lawsuit in the Fifth Circuit right now called Gonzalez versus Mayor of City Hills. Uh, Sylvia um, uh, will tell you her story. I just want to note two things that her story illustrates, right? First, that qualified immunity uh, doesn't just protect police officers, it protects anyone who works for the government, right? In her case, it was the mayor of her town, it was the police chief who was not really acting as a police chief in her town, and it was a special investigator, right? That's first point. And the second point is that even if you win at the district court level, right, and your case is allowed to proceed, which is exactly what happened with Sylvia, we actually won at the district court level. And the, uh, the, the judge said that qualified immunity should not shield these government workers in her case. Even if that happens, government can still take this case up on appeal under this very complicated doctrine called interlocutory review doctrine, where you essentially get to freeze everything and go to the higher court and say, hey, the district court said qualified immunity shouldn't shield me. Is the district court right? Um, and that essentially, as things stand right now, is freezing Sylvia's case in place for at least a year because appeals take a very long time, right? And here's another horrible thing. Even if we win at the Fifth Circuit and go back down, then on summary judgment, the government gets to do it again. They get to invoke qualified immunity again. And we're going to go up to the Fifth Circuit again to defend, uh, to, to defend it. So you have this incredible obstacles which make it very difficult for plaintiffs to find civil rights lawyers in the first place to even commit their time to this, right? So again, uh, as I transition to Sylvia, I want you to think about who should be that person who is carrying the, the cost of the constitutional violation. Should it be Sylvia on whom that violation was committed or should it be the people who actually committed that violation? So, um, uh, Sylvia, let me transition to you so you yes. can actually tell these folks what happened. Yes. Uh, this actually happened in 2019. I decided to run for city council, and I did a lot of work. I went out every day campaigning, and I spoke with over 500 households. And each household has at least two people, maybe more. So I... Uh, listen to their problems with the city. And they were very unhappy with the city manager and the way things were being run. Uh, they couldn't get a hold of him. He wouldn't answer his calls and he wouldn't return uh, uh, voicemails. Uh, they had a lot of issues with their neighbors. It went on and on. So in the process, uh, we started a petition to get a replacement person uh, to take his place once he would be 
we're, because we were going to uh, remove him. We were going to um, try to remove him and do the will of the residents. Um, so we, we started out and we, with this petition, we got quite a uh, people signing it. We were really lucky because we only had a week before the first city council meeting. So uh, in May of 2019, I won my seat on city council and became the first Hispanic woman to be elected to the Castle Hill City Council. So I was real happy about that. I intended to work really hard. I was had a, I had done so much already. I put out signs, I sent letters, I sent cards. I talked to a lot of people at the grocery store, on the street, when I was walking, you name it. So um, that's how I won. Um, but because I disagreed with the city government, they in turn threw me in jail and violated my civil rights, my first amendment rights. And uh, there was really nothing I could do about it um, because of course they have qualified immunity. So at my first meeting, um, the mayor, the police chief, they allowed all these people to jump up out of their chairs and hurl insults to me that I wasn't qualified, that I was this, that I was that. I mean, it went on and on. And uh, finally, um, we were there till 12 midnight. So what we did is we recessed to start the following day. The following day, the city manager passed out a lot of handouts and I had a stack of them at my desk. The secretary bought me an open records request that was made by my opponent that lost the election to me, who was very upset with me and had come there with all her friends to badger me with insults. So um, I went over to talk to her and while I was to her, the police captain came over and said, the mayor wants to talk to you. So I went over and he said, where's the, the uh, petition? And I said, well, I don't know. It was turned in yesterday. That's the last time I saw it. And he says, uh, we, I think it's in your binder. You need to look in your binder. So I opened my binder and I start going through all these papers. And to my surprise, the petition was in there. So I picked it up and I handed it to him. And uh, he said, oh, you probably picked it up by accident. You know, don't worry about it. I didn't, I thought nothing of it. So I went on and, um, and uh, so I, I, uh, I, I had, I picked up all the handouts at that time and put them in my book. So I think that was a problem. I should have probably checked to make sure the petition wasn't in there. Um, but here again, just because I disagreed with the city officials they made sure they wanted to hurt me and they threw me in jail. Um, and what happened um, is that uh, the, the uh, one of the city council members wrote an article in the news uh, letter for Castle Hill. So that goes out to all the residents. And he wrote about how to remove a seated city council person. You have to convict them of a crime and file a lawsuit which is exactly what they did. That was their game plan. And they worked in unison to have me removed. They did a really good job because it worked. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I filed a lawsuit. Uh, okay, let's see here. The city oh, and yeah. attorney. Why huh? Yeah, uh, so why don't you also tell, so uh, essentially in order to retaliate against you for uh, speaking out against the city manager, they made sure that you ended up in jail for a day, right? Oh, so yes. kind of like describe uh, what happened to you, like how you were put in there, how you were treated, your daughter's situation and all that. Yes, uh, well, another thing that happened, uh, the city uh, attorney told me I was no longer on council because the person who swore me in, Bear County Sheriff, was not qualified, although he had uh, the previous Bear County Sheriff uh, swore in two people, and that was not a problem. Um, on my, uh, uh, when I was thrown in jail, I found out later that instead of going directly to the DA's office with this, uh, uh, this uh, 
warrant for my arrest, they circumvented it. And they went to a judge, had him sign it, and then uh, they threw me in jail. And that particular maneuver is what they use on really bad criminals that are a threat to society. So they have to get them off the street. So they wanted to be sure to hurt me. They wanted to make sure that I went to jail because if they had given it to the DA, he would have kicked it out since I did nothing criminal. So it was, it was a, a horrible experience to say the least. It affected my, me, my husband, my daughter. Um, it, was, it was horrible. Uh, the next thing that happened when I was arrested, it was like being arrested at my daughter's office because she worked for the Bear County Sheriff's Office and she was located in the same building. There was a lot of chatter, you know, people talking, you know, they wanted to go see Liz's uh, mother, you know, in jail. And uh, it was, it was horrible. It was humiliating for her. And I think it affected her career in a negative way. Uh, she was really upset. So they take me in, in there to the, uh, to the processing center. And the first thing they do is handcuff me and uh, they frisk me and, and then they uh, fingerprinted me. And then they, they put me into a cube, a cube where there was a full body x-ray on me. It was horrible. I didn't want to go in there, but I lost all my, uh, all my rights. I was a criminal. So they did what they wanted. They put me in that cubicle and the x-ray machine went up and down on my body and and what it is, is they were looking for any uh, drugs or, or possibly weapons that I might have on my body. So I passed that, I guess, you know, and uh, the next thing that happened, uh, I got a mug shot and that mug shot was plastered all over the news media on television, the newspaper, the internet, the YouTube, and it'll be on the computer forever. It was a horrible experience. They kept having all of these um, different uh, reporters to make a new report. So it was constantly, and it was a very hurtful thing because my family is here in San Antonio. I grew up here in San Antonio. My friends are here. People were very unkind to me, some of my neighbors, because they thought I was a criminal. And I did nothing criminal. I mean, I, I, just, I just tried to do my, my job, which was uh, working on the, getting the will of the residents, uh, voting with the will of the residents. But uh, anyway, that, that happened to me. Um, there were a few telephones there and there was a lot of people. There was prostitutes, drug addicts, people that were drunk or a lady with two black guys. I mean, you name it, it was in there. And I had to sit on a, a cold metal a bench and, and I was handcuffed all day long from morning until night. And um, I couldn't stand up because if I did, they yelled at me uh, that I had to sit down. So I lost all my rights. And then uh, after all of that, six people that are uh, connected with uh, the city officials uh, filed a lawsuit against me asking, uh, for me to step down from city council and for me to be uh, going to a judge and jury trial to get me convicted of my crime. I was no longer on city council and my, or my, my case was dismissed. And so my attorneys kept calling them and they refused to remove me. So this cost me a lot of money because it, it lasted almost two years and I had to be paying attorneys to defend me. So, um, it was a very hard time and, and that I had to go through and I didn't have a choice and I had to spend so much money that I didn't have. I'm a retired person. Um, I had good chances, but bad things happened to me. Sylvia, um, uh -huh. yeah, thank you very much for um, sharing that story and we will be happy to also, she will be happy to answer any of the questions you guys might have. Yes. I got one question and that was about kind of explaining again um, where is Sylvia's lawsuit at this point and how did it end up 
there, right? So we basically filed a complaint saying that uh, Sylvia's First Amendment rights were violated. She spoke out against the city manager. And because of that, they essentially launched a retaliatory campaign, which ended up in her being thrown in jail uh, in order to intimidate her. Um, and the district court judge said, these are good claims you are allowed to proceed despite the invocation of qualified immunity. And it was really funny because, you know, uh, we worked on this complaint for a long time because as you can tell, there are a lot of things that happened to Sylvia in addition to being thrown in jail. It's kind of like entire, you know, many different things they did to ensure that uh, she would be forced out of the city council and would not be able to speak out again. Um, and we spent all this time gearing up, filing the complaint, um, and then several days later, boom, qualified immunity response, right? It was just motion to dismiss based on qualified immunity. And they weren't even attempting to explain themselves at all whatsoever. They just basically said, even if she says all this, and even if it's true, qualified immunity applies, and that's it. Um, and then we briefed qualified immunity on the motion to dismiss stage, explaining why the violation of a constitutional right of this nature would be clearly established. And that's the clearly established test from 1982 that folks have been talking about. Um, and we wanted the district court. The judge said, you're right, she should be allowed a day in court, right? And uh, instead of proceeding to discovery, now she overcame this challenge at the motion to dismiss stage. Instead of proceeding to discovery and figuring out evidence, uh, the uh, defendant said, hold on, we don't have to do this. We actually can go to the Court of Appeals, right? Normally, you can only go to the Court of Appeals when the judgment is final, right? So once you're allowed to proceed with your claims, once you go to trial, once jury basically determines what's going to happen to you, then you can appeal, final judgment. But in this case, everything freezes and the government gets to ask the Court of Appeals to review the determination by the district court. And that's essentially what's happening here, where instead of actually looking at all the documents, because a lot of First Amendment stuff actually goes into, you know, getting evidence about what was said when, um, instead of doing that, we actually freeze everything and we're going to be briefing this before the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. And generally with constitutional cases, it takes longer for the courts of appeals to kind of make their determination. And after that, if we win and the Court of Appeals actually says, you know what, the district court rightfully denied qualified immunity, we get to go back, right? And we get to start discovery. But then there will be this other opportunity for defendants at the motion for summary judgment stage, where they again get to file this paper and they again get to say, look at this again, qualified immunity applies. And if we again win there, the case is gonna go back up to the fifth circuit on the motion to summary judgment stage, where again, the court will have to look at whether the district court's determination was correct. You can do it at least five times before you can actually get to figure out, uh, you know, whether uh, the uh, defendants actually violated the constitutional right and whether the remedy is due, right? So qualified immunity, one of the biggest problems with it, but one of the problems that's least understood because it's so complex and procedural is just by how long it delays litigation, right? And the funny thing, of course, is Harlow versus Fitzgerald, the case where the clearly established test came to be, you know, you have Justice Powell talk about how, you know, you don't want this litigation to keep going, right? So we kind of need for efficiency reasons to stop it. But qualified immunity cases are incredibly long, right? One of my clients, he's been fighting it for six years, right? We went to the United States Supreme Court and now we're going back to the Sixth Circuit. And again, they haven't even answered his complaint yet. So uh, using qualified immunity, at this way can also be a weapon in that it deters people with claims who, ha who have merits to file the lawsuit in the first place because of incredible cost of litigation. Yeah. Okay, well, that was a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Anya, and thank you, Sylvia. Uh, it's a lot of information. And I think, you know, it also just goes to show one, how a lot of people who end up in jail uh, in our system and even who go to prison are completely misunderstood and 
you know, Sylvia, I mean, the same thing you said about some of the other folks, they might even think about you, you know, here's this hardened criminal who did all this stuff and she ended up here with Sarah on TV, but often that's not really the case. It's sometimes a misunderstanding or a gross miscarriage of justice. That's a manipulation of a system that's supposed to be there to protect, but often harms people that shouldn't be in, uh, you know, we can, you know, at some point talk about, you know, the, you know, legalization of other, you know, work and all sorts of stuff. But I think for now, I really appreciate, uh, you know, a lot of the insights that were given and just to clarify that and, you know, we'll move on to any questions uh, folks have for you guys and then we're going to go on to a general question and answer segment for everyone. I know we've already got quite a few submitted, um, so folks can stick around for that and then we're going to um, wrap after the final portion. So, uh, Michael, I'll let you take it away. Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Jonathan. I know David from Representative Balde's office had a question if he would like to ask it directly about how other countries approach this. Otherwise, I am happy to read that for him. Um, I'm not seeing him on the list right now. He might have had to hop off. So I'll go ahead and read that. Um, he was wondering, um, you know, how do, um, how do other advanced industrial countries, other Western countries, so are so-called, how with these developed rules of law that we've seen, that we see in our own country, how do they approach this issue? And do they have similar, uh, similar concepts to qualified immunity or do they do something different? And that's for, for any, any one of our speaker experts who may know. Is the first time I've heard that question. That is interesting. Um, professor, have you or Anya, I don't know if either of you or Jay have done any research into case to, you know, how other countries approach. I think it's kind of a uniquely American concept and it's something that's also, you know, wasn't really legislatively developed. This was obviously in response to the 1871 uh, Congressional Act, the Ku Klux Klan Act or also known as the Civil Rights Act of 1871 that did expressly the opposite and said that government, this was obviously in response to the Ku Klux Klan's behavior, in some cases directly working with, if not themselves engaged in domestic terrorism against black people in this country, that they should be held liable and directly accountable. And then obviously, you know, we had that case with the clergy members who were integrating the rest stop in 19, 67 where um, this whole thing got created and that was the good faith version and then moved on to the 1982 version where um, that the kind of current version of qualified immunity we know exists but I to in my my understanding is it's it's a completely uni uniquely American invention but does anyone else have any insights on that I, I think that's basically right I mean the thing I'd add is that uh, other countries have just such a different system. You know, many other countries don't have the same written constitution and, and sort of bill of rights that we do among the ones that do. They often have a kind of more of an administrative law system or another sort of a whole network of, of remedies and accountability. Um, so the, you know, it, it, it does partly arise out of sort of the American tradition and the American tort system and our, frankly, our lack of another uh, really sound mechanism for, uh, for administration and, and, uh, supervision of government officials. So I think that's right. And it's in a way, uh, there's a lot going into that. Right. Yeah. Fascinating question. Though. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Sorry. Did you go, go ahead? Sorry. No, I, I would also compare it to countries that actually are uh, more of a developing countries rather developed. Right. So uh, I know I have a very slight accent, so you can't possibly guess where I'm from. Right. But originally I came from a former Soviet Union. Right. And I grew up in the system that essentially was a failed state by then. Right. In, in a country called Kyrgyzstan. And uh, I always tell this story about uh, my mother and uh, I. We were walking back home. It was kind of dark. We just went to the grocery stores. I had two muffins, one in each hand, you know, really happy about them. Looking forward to going home. And all of a sudden this guy comes from the back and grabs my mother's purse. Right. And she starts fighting him and she just wants to make sure he doesn't take her purse. And, you know, it's mortal combat. Uh, I'm standing there with my two muffins. Right. I can't do anything. I'm completely shocked. Um, and then the guy runs away. My mother looks at me and she's like, 
what did I pay this Taekwondo lessons for? So at that point, instead of going to police and asking them for help, right, we actually begin looking for the guy ourselves. It's really dark. We're looking, walking around this micro district. It's like Khrushchevka style buildings, you know, and we're screaming, please give us back the passport. You can keep everything else, but give us back the passport, right? My mother happened to have the passport in her purse because she was worried about our apartment being robbed. She wanted to make sure that passport is on her. And now she was robbed with, it, with this. There's no win essentially. But the point is that instead of going to police, instead of asking them for help, we actually chose to pursue it ourselves because we were worried that there was, because of the lack of accountability in that system, that the officer could actually hurt us more than he could help us. So my mother is like, this is not worth it. Let's just try to figure this out ourselves. And in fact, throughout my life in Kyrgyzstan, every time we, uh, faced a challenge, we tried to resolve it without getting police involved, right? And that's a problem. And that problem has similar roots in that essentially there is no accountability. And when there is no accountability, you worried about turning to government for help because you actually think, oh my God, they might actually hurt me and they wouldn't have to pay for it, right? So one of the reasons I do this work is because I very much don't want this to be the case in a country like ours here in the United States of America. So that's kind of another, another kind of place to compare it against and ensure it doesn't happen here. In fact, it already happens in many circumstances, but like making sure that going forward, it wouldn't happen. Absolutely. And although that tale comes all the way from Central Asia, I think it's far too common. You know, we hear, especially in actually some of the immigrant communities, a lot of us have worked with that exact same thing, especially, you know, over recent years with um, some um, more aggressive policies from the feds. But yeah, I, th I think that's absolutely spot on. And, and again, part of ending qualified immunity, especially in regard to law enforcement, is about restoring integrity. And in fact, I, I was listening to a conservative podcast last night, um, just kind of getting myself in the mindset for this. And, they were, and, and there's actually a couple law enforcement officers discussing it, one who had a legal background. And they were saying, you know, all the cops who are out there, you know, we hear about, you know, they're going to lose their jobs. Everyone's going to get sued to oblivion. Everyone's freaking out. And first, uh, you know, they had a lot of choice words for people on the left, but then they said, you know, this has nothing to do with you. 99% of cops who are obeying the law are not even going to notice the difference in this. This is only for cops. So even from a more conservative perspective, they were saying that this does not affect you. And we're, you know, one of them was a legal expert. And he was saying, you know, this is, th this will not affect you. This will not hurt you unless it should affect you. But if that's the case, you shouldn't be a cop in the first place. And, you know, it's just kind of an interesting, unique perspective. Uh, and that was, was, you know, listening to it to hear different perspectives on it. But yeah, so very good. And thanks for that story, Anya. Um, and yeah, yeah, for sake of time, I know we've got a lot of questions to get to. So Mike, I'll let you get to the next one in the queue. Yeah, absolutely. So this one is from Representative Spritzer, who I know had to hop off earlier, but he said he'd catch it on the uh, on the uh, replay. Um, and so I think this is one that we've spoken to a little bit today, um, but if we can just kind of circle back on it, this question is, can we get some explicit clarity as it relates to qualified immunity between criminal and civil accountability for police and between state and federal courts? As much as the lack of prosecution of police for shooting or otherwise killing people is a problem, Problem. Qualified immunity is specifically about whether victims and their families have a civil remedy, correct? And to the extent that this is based on U.S. Supreme Court precedent, we in Wisconsin can't change that federal precedent. So is, is there a distinction between federal suits over federal constitution and civil rights violations versus our ability to ensure that there is a civil remedy in state court, even if there is not a remedy in federal court? So oh, I'd, I'd be happy to address that. And I, I really, I think the, the premises in the question are all exactly right. Um, qualified immunity is only a civil doctrine. Uh, it does not prohibit criminal prosecutions. Um, and, and, and in terms of the state versus federal, this is kind of what I was discussing earlier, that in a formal sense, right, there is a federal civil rights statute, which we generally call Section 1983. And that statute allows you to bring a claim in federal court for a violation of your federal constitutional rights. And the Supreme Court, in theory, interpreting that statute has said qualified immunity is, is part of that. You have to overcome qualified immunity to bring a section 1983 suit in federal court. 
So states cannot change that because that is federal law. But what states can do is create a what I usually often call a state analog to Section 1983. In other words, a state civil rights law that says you have a right to bring a lawsuit for violations of your state constitutional rights. Um, and because most states have constitutions that you know largely mirror or even more protective than the federal constitution, um, that you know is a robust remedy. And then because that statute is just state law, and states of course are free to define state law themselves, you know, within constitutional limits, they can simply clarify that qualified immunity will not be applicable. Because what was happening for a long time, I mean, there are lots of other states that have these Section 1983 analogs. Um, even before Colorado, there were, I believe, uh, you know, seven or eight other states, depending on how you count it. But even though none of those statutes mentioned qualified immunity, what the state courts were doing in those states was basically just importing the federal doctrine and saying, well, you know, it's good enough there, so it's good enough here. So that's why in Colorado, and then subsequently in New Mexico, and even in New York City, it was so crucial to explicitly clarify that qualified immunity will not be applicable to that state law remedy to prevent the courts from basically recreating it at the state level. Absolutely. I, yeah, I, I think that's spot on. And I actually I just came up with a buddy of mine in a discussion I was going over with him, and I just want to relay uh, his information. I think there's two other pieces to it, but one of the ideas that mirrors kind of what Jay said is, you know, that there's still a reason for states to enact it because their lawyer, lawyers can confine their claims to state law and bring them into state court. And then they're able to, you know, circumvent the federal qualified immunity doctrine. And um, it also importantly touches on when the Supreme Court does revisit the issue, as we've heard from Justices Thompson, uh, excuse me, Thomas and Sotomayor, um, it can refer to the legislative trend in states as well, and it helps um, kind of the, you know, the general, uh, it, it helps indirectly in that sense. But aside from that, I mean, there's also uh, one other portion of it, which is what Terry touched on, uh, Officer Blevins, which is that this is, and, and we talked about a little bit earlier, so I speak, it's partially about having some skin in the game. It's partially about saying that there's a, and at least it's not an end all. There's a lot of work to do in a lot of different sections and it's not all about law enforcement reform or qualified immunity. There's a lot of target economic investment. There's a lot that needs to be done, I think, to right some of the historic wrongs that are currently plaguing our society and some of the inequities. But it certainly does make things significantly better in regard to an additional mechanism for accountability and transparency that does not exist now. And without that mechanism, there is no opportunity and no reason for corrupt cops not to keep moving up and up through the system and for the worst parts of our law enforcement system to continuously be reinforced because they have a, in many, in almost every single case, there's a blanket shield. So there, so there are additional benefits doing this way, but Mark's, Representative Sprites is correct that it would not, you know, states do not have the ability to overturn the federal doctrine, of course, um, but it's, it, it's all part of the same puzzle, pieces of the puzzle though. Great. Yeah, we've got another question here. Um, looking, so this one, this one's out of Milwaukee. Question is, we hear a lot about qualified immunity in terms of police violence. Could qualified immunity also be used to protect officers against other police activities, such as questionable instances of surveillance? It's becoming a particular concern of specific residents in the city ever since certain like uh, protests for social justice have started. I'm happy to take that one. Absolutely. I mean, qualified immunity is an extremely broad doctrine, right? As long as you work for government, for, for state, local, federal government, you name it, qualified immunity protects you. And it protects you uh, not only in excessive force types of claims, it protects you uh, in uh, if you violate other constitutional rights too, right? That's why we thought it would be nice for you to uh, kind of hear what Sylvia has to say, because in her case, right, you actually did not have excessive use of force claim. You had a claim of retaliating against her for speaking out against 
one of the people who were um, essentially in cahoots with the police chief, right? And a police chief in this situation was not using excessive force. He was just using his power to investigate Sylvia and to concoct uh, particular charges that uh, you know would then force her to be thrown in jail and intimidate her from not speaking. So yeah, it's it's an extremely broad doctrine. And as you guys are considering this, think about how you want to you know cabinet and what you want to do with it and whether you want to cabinet at all. Um, uh, but right now, so long as you happen to work for the government, including federal government, if you're an IRS agent or you know a Bureau of Land Management agent, right? Uh, it protects you and it protects you for violating any kind of uh, constitutional rights as well as certain statutory rights as well. Right, and I think, and just to piggyback off that, I think part of the reason why there's an emphasis on law enforcement is because of the, well, because it's a life and death situation and the abuses are so apparent and so consistent and we're seeing it over and over and over. And, you know, I will, you know, I think it just speaks to part of a larger issue that we really have to reimagine what we know as safety protection. You know, you see, for example, all this footage now of this 80 year old man protesting, just standing by himself, getting pushed over, his head is cracked against the ground. That's not keeping anyone safe. That's not helping, you know, that, that, that hurts. In fact, if you're in law enforcement, you're pro law enforcement, that's hurting you, you know, it's not keeping anyone safe. So I think that's why the emphasis is, is, kind of targeted towards them, uh, towards that profession right now. Um, yeah, and I know, and I think we had a couple of questions from Isaiah, Michael, should we just hammer through those? Yep, yep, working through those. So that so that was one of his, the other one was kind of covered by uh, Representative Spritzer's question. So um, moving, moving on to another question here. So someone else asked, without qualified immunity, a lot of onus falls directly on the officers. Is there another system that would replace qualified immunity to put at least some responsibility on the higher ups giving orders? So within maybe the chain of command at the, at the law enforcement level or the union line or something like that? Yeah, I'm happy to take that one on as well, uh, because, uh, you know, one of the uh, model bills that IJ has been working on actually involves very much that. And it's kind of uh, uh, similar to what Tim, uh, Senator Tim Scott is talking about right now when, they're talk when it comes to Justice and Policing Act, right? As I mentioned in my presentation earlier, uh, there is a big through line in the accountability jurisprudence historically, right? The focus was very much on does the victim get a remedy for violations of the the individual right, right? And uh, one of the ways to provide that remedy was through uh, suing the official directly. Another one is actually the system of respondeat superior liability against municipalities, right? Um, and that would essentially work similarly to the way we hold private corporations accountable when their employees do something that's uh, not good. Um, and um, uh, what, what that does, interestingly, is it kind of incentivizes to minimize constitutional violations on the front end, right? Because it incentivizes municipalities to hire better, to train better, to, as Jay actually says, to have skin in the game from the municipality's perspective as well, right? But then there is, of course, another question in terms of what kind of accountability would the officer have? And that's something that you can also play around with. Um, uh, our model bill, for example, uh, on the state level talks about perhaps the ability to actually fire the officer, right, after it is found that this officer violated constitutional rights. So at the very least, the municipality, while it is on the hook for paying the damages, uh, would actually have an opportunity to fire that bad apple, but also would have an opportunity to hire good apples um, on the front uh, end of this. There, there are several different ways to think through this and to, you know, work around this. But yes, thinking about employers and incentivizing them to take more responsibility for what the employees do is definitely a worthy endeavor. And if I can just briefly uh, add on to that, um, I, I mean, I absolutely agree that employer liability is a significant piece of the remedy here. Uh, in, in, and in part, that's just the financial reality that like individual officers are rarely going to be able to fully cover judgments. Um, 
so I, I would, the only two things I would add though would be, I think one approach that's also very promising um, that Cato has sort of advocated for elsewhere is basically an individual uh, insurance approach a bit where municipalities could spend you know, the money that they are already using to indemnify officers and instead fund individual insurance policies for officers so that there's always going to be funds to cover any judgment. But over time, uh, you would basically see officers' premiums either go up or down. And you could sort of structure it such that you know, if their premiums went down over time, they got to pocket the difference. But if they went up because they had repeated instances of complaints of misconduct, uh, you know, they might eventually be priced out of the market. So it's, you know, sort of a free market solution to police accountability. Um, so I think that there, I think that there are lots of creative rooms. There's lots of room for creative thinking on how to structure it. I, I guess the, the, what I see is sort of the two main principles is you have to ensure that the victim is going to be made whole. Uh, you can't have a system where they get left out in the cold. And one way or another, you have to ensure that individual officers have skin in the game. Uh, and I, so I think you can bring employer liability into that in a lot of ways, but it shouldn't come at the expense of holding individual officers accountable. Absolutely. Actually, maybe that's one where a couple of other speakers, I don't know if uh, Officer Blevins or Professor Bode or, uh, you know, anyone else wants to weigh in, but I think that's a great question and it speaks to you know, we have to imagine what things look like moving forward and what those mechanisms are, or if Ben and Jerry want to weigh in, but I think that's a really, yeah, I mean, I think that's a, that's essential. That's, that's a crucial part of it. Uh, well, I'll, I'll just jump in in terms of uh, the campaign to end qualified immunity. What, what Jay just expressed uh, is exactly our thinking. Um, I agree with all that too. Uh, I guess I'll just say, I think, Jay is really uh, nailed how all these things how all these things work together. Um, I will add, I think I mentioned this a little bit before, but I do think another piece of this, which does go beyond qualified immunity, will be thinking about what mechanisms you know cities and taxpayers have to to make sure that they aren't continuing to employ uh, people who really are a repeated problem. Um, and there are a range of different kinds of you know employment and union and doctrines to get in the way of that but one you know one obvious one obvious piece of this is if you find you have somebody who's who's violating people's rights over and over again uh they probably shouldn't be in a position where they can do that anymore right and and you know unfortunately that's one of the things that we're seeing over and over and over these high profile cases is exactly what you're referring to professor but and that mechanism doesn't exist and you're and obviously qualified immunity like i said is one piece of the puzzle but i think there's you know, the, the question that was asked really gets at the heart of it, and that's going to be key to this moving forward, and it can't just happen in a vacuum. Um, and, and I know there's been conversations as well about insurance, and that's a way of, you know, as Jay said, you know, you can, you know, drive the, you know, you can use mechanisms in a capitalist society to uh, enforce or, you know, pr pursue burden in that fashion. But I think there's there's a lot of different ways to, to cut this cookie. And, and it's important to keep keep that in mind moving forward, because, you know, the other side of this is since, you know, since this has been this doctrine has been created in 1967 and really the current iteration from 1982, the, the, the there has been a culture that's entrenched itself that will not, that there's going to be a lot of unpacking there. And I don't think it's going to be, you know, a overnight success sort of thing. Although, you know, one thing I will point to that Jerry talked about is, is so key that the New York City, the three, and that wasn't just one police association, that was actually three different that all put that letter together and had their legal team consult, and then they put it out, and then someone leaked it, you know, publicly, now it's available on the internet. But they said, now that qualified immunity is over in New York, we have to operate within the law. And that says it right there. What was happening before that? That suggests that be previously they did not feel like, you know, if you have to explicitly say, hey, now we got to operate within the law. And also we got to cut down on physically violent sorts of confrontations with people. And we got to find other tactics to do our job. I mean, stop threatening me with a good time. That's how it should be, you know, and all it took was that transition. So there are some immediate benefits, but it's going to take a lot more reimagining of, of what even safety means, what, you know, what everyone's role is. And, and, you know, quite frankly, the other side of it's true too. I mean, I'll give one really quick story, which is, you know, there, 
I don't even want to give a strategy. I'll just say this. There's a lot of police resources right now being dedicated to really inappropriate things, to low-level drug offenses. And the way it's been described to me by a supervising officer, you know, someone in charge, was that they want the highest trophies for the lowest risk, which is a really sick way to incentivize. And then you look at the clearance rates and even the conviction rates for some of the most violent crimes in our society, especially when you're talking about rape. Uh, and it's ludicrous, you know, we can't look at those numbers and think that there's an efficient, effective system out there. Well, a lot of the resources are being dedicated to things that are really not appropriate. And it's in, you know, again, we have to take this as part of a larger piece of the puzzle, but I think there's, yeah, there's, there's going to have to be a lot of work done and yeah, really great question. So appreciate that. And if, I ask if, Levins, go if, ahead. if you don't mind. Yeah. I'll just comment. Uh, I, most people don't realize that we have over 18,000 separate law enforcement agencies in this country. And we have almost no centralized system of governance or accountability for those agencies. The FBI has the civil rights division, which is great, but they don't have very much authority over local law enforcement agencies. It, we're talking about silos that, that basically do whatever they want. And if they don't have any political accountability to, to their city councils or to their, you know, to the, the, any sort of governing, you know, po uh, political uh, group, you know, like the, the, at the state level or at the county level or at the city level, there is no accountability. They do whatever they want. And, and it's, this is not good for law enforcement. And somebody asked, you know, how other countries handle this. Other countries don't have this issue mostly. And I'll tell you why, because they don't have the same system of government that we do. I traveled a lot for the U S department of state abroad, teaching uh, police departments, uh, you know, uh, throughout the, the world about, you know, rule of law and accountability and corruption and that sort of thing. And they're astounded when I tell them the, our system of government, that there is no sort of central governance. Even Canada has a better system than we do. And people in Canada respect law enforcement. You know, they hold them in high regard because they know that there is accountability there and that, that they have a recourse. If a police officer does something wrong, they have recourse. And I'll tell you, most most police agencies in the United States, especially the larger ones, most of them in my experience care. They don't want bad officers out on the street. All it does is create issues for them. So um, sometimes the court is, because there is so, there's so many silos and there's no central system of governance, the courts are our only recourse to actually force these agencies and these officers to do the right thing. And when we have immun implied immunity in place, it, it really stymies a lot of the power that the courts have over these individual agencies in order to, to hold them accountable. So it's essential. And from a law enforcement, and I talk to cops all the time, I tell them, why would you want implied immunity in place that, re that removes that trust, that system of accountability for the bad cops? You know, you don't want to work next to bad cops. You don't want them out there doing things on video that basically, you know, cast a uh, sort of a paint us with a broad brush. You know, we want to get rid of those bad officers and we want to hold the bad agencies accountable. And this is one of the ways that we do that. Sorry, I get passionate about it because I love what I did in law enforcement. I love my fellow brothers and sisters in law enforcement. There's a lot of really great people and, and they are fighting an uphill battle right now because of this, this you know, poor perception that the community has of us and our poor relations with the community. And so this is a very important part of us reestablishing that trust with our communities. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and so I think we've got one last question here. Um, I know Supervisor Clancy is on the call. If he wants to hop on and ask that question, that'd be great. So much, Michael. And I'm, I'm really grateful that, that we could have this opportunity to, to learn more about this topic today um, and for the statewide legislation put forward by uh, Senator Latanya Johnson and Representative uh, Brostoff. I, I, the, the wide range and the insight from the guests today has really been valuable. Uh, we have a, a, a resolution pending at the, the county level uh, because clearly like we, we don't have a, uh, any absence of um, 
examples of the horrific you know, misconduct that this sort of, of legislation could discourage. Um, and I'm really happy to see some of my colleagues here today. So I know we have supervisors Taylor, Haas, and, and Shay. My colleague Supervisor Martin couldn't be here today, but she had a, a question kind of within the framework of racial equity and what this would look like when we implemented it. Uh, and that was, a, what are the costs of malpractice insurance for law enforcement kind of generally? And then could requiring law enforcement to carry malpractice insurance uh, prevent black and indigenous people of color from becoming uh, law enforcement officers in the first place? Uh, and that was a, uh, I'm, I'm glad that we're kind of getting into the, <laughs> to the weeds on this so much because it looks like we have uh, hopefully some broad support for this. And I, I, what I'm hearing is that this is overall something that's going to be really helpful, but wanted to, uh, to bring that here for her today. Um, so I'll take a shot at answering part of that. I mean, I, I think, you know, insurance rates, right, are going to be determined based on so many different factors, you know, in terms of both like the particular locality as well as what the current, you know, existing legal regime is. So I, I, I you know, I certainly can't tell you, and I don't think anyone honestly could tell you with confidence what hypothetically insurance rates would look like, um, you know, if the state did X, Y, and Z. What, what I would say though, in terms of the risk that like the cost of insurance would keep people from being police officers. Um, I, I, I think it's important to keep in mind that municipalities are already spending significant money to indemnify police officers. So, you know, the, what I'm proposing that, you know, and I think what most people mean when they talk about an insurance based approach is not just some freestanding requirement to tell cops to go out and buy insurance, right? Rather it would be municipal employers funding those insurance policies. Now, I think it would be interesting to set that up in a way where as officers rates changed, the delta, right, between what sort of the base level of funding is and what in light of their own conduct sort of their rates became, you know, should have consequence for them. That's not the only way you'd have to do it, but I absolutely think you could, you could set that up basically, you know, where they're not having to pay for it out of their own pocket to begin with, rather, the state is making much more efficient and judicious use of the money it's already spending to indemnify these officers. One other thing I wanted to add, this is Representative Myers, I wanted to jump in. Supervisor Clancy, there is a bill that is pending because I wrote it that would uh, actually uh, require the police unions and the unions that still have bargaining power in the state of Wisconsin to hold that insurance on the officers that serve under them as well. And I know that gets into a touchy subject with a lot of people because they want the, what you can force a union to do. But if they're the only ones that still have public bargaining rights in the state of Wisconsin, and we're still having a lot of these issues, I feel it is the union's responsibility and that they can do more when it comes to uh, incentives to act right, when it comes to making sure that they don't have to continue spending out this money. Because just like Jay said, um, in the city of Milwaukee alone, we have spent over, I believe it was uh, 30 some million dollars and counting uh, in, in settlements because the settlements aren't free. We're paying for the settlements. The people pay for the settlements. We also pay for the backfill in um, making sure that we maintain officers at their current um, rate of uh, pay as far as the pension issue is concerned. So that's one of the, those are two of the biggest issues in the city of Milwaukee alone. Now I can't speak for any other municipality, but there are only a few municipalities that um, have their own pension systems in the state of Wisconsin. Most officers that are regular municipal police officers are covered under the WRS, which is the same system that the representatives are uh, the judges and uh, school teachers, people who work for the state are covered under. Everybody's not under WRS. So this gets into also a deeper conversation about who is covered under WRS insurance and who is covered under some separate entity. So those are all questions and uh, things that I would love to follow up with you about because I've had these conversations with several different members, both Republican and Democrat, and also with the county executive to have some of these conversations as well, because these are some fiscal issues that we have to look at. And I'm speaking from Milwaukee County right now that we have to have to be able to survive and to move forward if we want to maintain a consistent uh, level of services across uh, what we're doing now. 
Yeah, and, uh, yeah, I think that's 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 right, and I think Representative Myers, uh, you know, is not only you know a leader on these issues and quite well versed on it, but I think she's absolutely right in her assessment. And I would say that, you know, to Jay's point as well, a little bit. There's, I mean, usually, like if you're a lawyer, I mean, we have lawyers on here, or if you're a medical professional, in in certain instances, like a doctor, you know, that's the, you know, unless you're in private. I mean, yeah, that's that's usually how it's set up, and I can't imagine it be that much different than this, especially since they're public workers. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good point. And I appreciate, I know that, uh, you know, and I've, we, you know, we've, we've worked on some issues very recently, especially including stuff on the lakefront, uh, you know, some supervisor Martin um, is, is absolutely on point when saying that there's got to be some, you know, racial reckoning as far as policing is concerned as well. And I think, you know, you don't want to advance any policy. It's going to disturb that or in a, in a negative way, but um you know, I look at it right now and you see in Milwaukee, who are the, what's the most diverse, who has the most African American, and, you know, the, as far as the classes are concerned, my understanding is that's the NCOs, the non-commissioned officers, and they're the ones that don't carry the guns, they're the ones that are usually from the community that don't live way out in the suburbs since we got rid of residency, and they're usually the ones that are bought up, I mean, I've, you know, I mean, I'm from Milwaukee, I've not, you know, I've grown up, you know, a lot of the folks as well, and, you know, I think that, it's part of a larger conversation. And I, and I think that her point's well taken that while we're looking at ending qualified immunity, we should really be rethinking how we can readjust lots of parts of the system because it's not just one aspect that needs to be accounted for. What, you know, and it's, and I really, and, you know, I'll just say on my own side of it, one thing I'm really against, I really don't like is all this idea of just equity training and diversifies training and stuff like that, because it's not just a training and just throw more money at the issue sort of problem. They're fundamental that, you know, they're, yeah. So anyway, that's a long conversation for another day, but I'm happy to talk offline with, with Representative Martin at, at length since she couldn't be here, but I think I, uh, you know, Representative Myers said it very well, but also there's probably some more follow-up and I hope that she'll end up being supportive of this resolution. And uh, thanks for the question and thanks for your work, Representative Clancy. And oh, and uh, we can't claim we cannot always change hearts and minds, but we can change policy that can change behavior. Absolutely. And uh, I see we're joined also by another uh, leader on this issue and an initial uh, co co author, our representative David Bowen, uh, who's with us. And so we're going to uh, first of all, thank you, David Bowen, for being with us. And uh, I'll, I'll uh, let you uh, grab the mic. Uh, go ahead and thank you very much. Or David, did you have something to say or was that just a hand raise and acknowledgement? Sorry. No, I, I was just uh, kind of just thanking you guys for, uh, you know, drafting this, putting the time, the energy uh, into highlighting this issue. We know uh, that especially unqualified uh, qualified immunity um, <laughs> needs to be unqualified immunity um, to reverse it um, and that there are different versions. So I just want to highlight that and, uh, encourage people let's keep going appreciate you and appreciate your leadership on this issue um so if we have no more questions uh and michael uh, i don't know if you see yep. any more coming no nope, that that looks like all of our questions here so i'll okay. let you wrap things up here yeah and we'll do i think we're going to have a quick press avail afterwards right yep for um, any of our speakers who are available still afterwards we've got another uh zoom link that went to you this morning um that we will be hopping to right immediately after this um if you're available just a few minutes we have a handful of members of the press who are on there we'll just take a few questions and then uh and then go from there yeah so Again, I really want to thank, uh, first of all, all of our partners on this who helped uh, edify today and make it happen. Uh, thank you to Officer Blevins. Thank you to Anya. Thank you to Ben and Jerry. Thank you to Jay. Thank you to Professor Bode. Uh, thank you very much as well to our legislative colleagues who are here, Representative Bowen, Representative uh, Myers, Representative Moore Makunde, Senator Taylor, and Senator um, uh, Johnson, I keep, I want to say LaTanya because we have two Senator Johnson in Wisconsin and they're very different. Uh, although one is a state senator, one's a United States senator, but uh, yeah, Senator, jo senator LaTanya Johnson. Um, and also thank you to uh, our other colleagues and other legislators from different um, bodies who joined us today. This is an issue that I've 
put a lot of work into and I've done a lot of research. And I will say a couple of years ago, I knew absolutely nothing about and I've tried to learn myself and, and do my best to educate others. But I think it's forums like this that are incredibly important in dissecting a very important but very complicated issue. And hopefully uh, we uh, were able to do that today. And I know that there is a lot of work that needs to be done as far as racial justice in our society and just building a more just society in general. But to me, ending qualified immunity is a key portion of that. And I will continue to work uh, tirelessly on passing AB 186 here in Wisconsin, as well as um, other efforts. And I really appreciate all the partners in that and, and everyone for coming out today. And if you're watching at home or watching this on you know, perpetuity in your own time on your phone some night, you know, not live, uh, thank you very much for tuning in. And even if you disagree, hopefully this was helpful to you. Um, and again, thanks everyone. Thank you to the speakers. And thank you very much to Michael and Rebecca for making this happen. We appreciate all of you. All right. Bye.